everybody doing in the house this morning? Good. Amen. So good to be in the house of God. Um, I just, uh, I know I've, I say this all the time, but with what we went through a couple of years ago, I never want to take for granted when we can come in here and we can we can praise and worship together. Because uh, I tell you what, uh, that, that was a dreary time. Um, not being able to come in here and, and the place be full and, and, uh, and not be able to, you know, having to distance yourself from people. Because I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I like to get all up on some people. I like to embrace people and hug people. And, you know, sometimes they get spit on and stuff like that. And y'all sit, you know, I told y'all before, I, the reason I don't come up a little further is because I know, I know how far my spit travels. And so y'all are good this morning. So, amen. And uh, I tell you what, funniest thing I was telling me and somebody were talking about it a couple weeks back about the whole, you know, the pandemic and all that mess. And uh, everybody started doing these driving services, right? And, and uh, those, you know, they, they were cool. You know, we actually, we uh, we had a couple over at our house. We've got a big field in front of the house and, and everybody came and they parked their cars and they either sat on their tailgates or on their toolboxes or they brought some little chairs and just kind of sat right there and we had everybody all spaced out and everything and, and it was just neat it was you know it, it was cool i thought it was a you know neat environment and uh, we had the service and everything was good and, and then we dismissed the service and guess what happened people started going from car to car hugging each other and i'm like what was the point of this i'm like we could have just went in the church and did this you know and uh I'm so glad we're done with all that that mess so and uh, that we could be in the house this morning and then we're thankful for our guests that are in the house this morning for the way you came back amen and uh, we're glad to have you and your family with us this morning let's give them a hand my brother james over here we're glad to have you this morning amen let's give him a hand as well and if i missed anybody i think i think everybody else is home folk right all right Hey, let's give our home folk a hand. Hey, Amen. Thank you for being here. I know we've got a lot of people that are still on vacation. Maybe, you know, a few people battling some sickness and things like that. But thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for being here. And for our guests, again, we want to thank you for being here. But we want you to know this is a place that you can come and you can feel welcome. And you can come as you are. We want you to come and, and be excited about coming here. And if you don't have a home, welcome home. We're not pleasant. Amen. If you got your Bibles with you this morning, let's turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, and I'm going to be starting with verse uh, 7. Amen. If y'all don't mind standing for the initial reading of God's Word, I, I appreciate that. Again, I didn't, I didn't actually say it during the service last Sunday, and I realized that, but I said it Wednesday. But we do want to thank Brother Matthew for running our computer system uh, last Sunday. We appreciate appreciate him. He did a great job. And then I uh, also want to say thank you to uh, Sister Daphne um, and Brother Mitch. Uh, Y'all see these new chairs we got up here on the platform? They donated those to the church, and, and they are beautiful, and they fit in with everything. So God bless y'all, and we appreciate it. Thank y'all so much. Let's, let's give them a hand as well. Amen. Lots of hands being given this morning. So, All right. Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 7. If you've got it in your word, say amen. 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 Let's get into it this morning. It says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Amen. This morning I want to talk to you for just a, a few moments about being free 
from captivity. Being free from captivity. Brother Eric, do you mind saying the prayer of our message this morning? Lord, we love you this morning. We praise you. Lord, thank you for every single thing that you did. Lord, thank you for waking us up this morning with breath in our lungs, Lord. Thank you for the homes that we woke up in, Lord. Just, uh, Lord, we know it says in your word that every bit of gift comes from above. And we know anything we have good in our lives, Lord, that came from you. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you be in this service this morning. Lord, I pray that you uh, walk out. I pray that you touch hearts and change lives. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all can be seated in the house this morning. Now, I want to paint a picture of what we just we just read. We're, we're talking here about the, the children of Israel. We're talking about God's chosen people, right? And the children of Israel, they had been enslaved for 400 years. And what had happened is in those 400 years, and I imagine that if, if I had been enslaved, gosh, somebody can enslave me for you know 40 minutes and, and and I'd probably grow like this, but the children of Israel had grown a sense of, of helplessness. And, and they were longing for their freedom. They were longing to be set free from this captivity that they were being held in. And, you know, so many times, you know, we begin to think about, you know, them actually, you know, being, you know, with the slave drivers and then being worked hard and somebody cracking whip on them and, and working out in the heat and, and the sand and all this stuff. To me, it sounds like a trip to the beach. You know, that's like slavery for me sometimes. Um, somebody, one of my friends posted on Facebook earlier this week. It says, they said, what advice do you have for a baby taking them to the beach for the first time? And I commented, Jesus, and a lot of them. Um, because, whoo, man, that's rough. But, you know, these people, they had been, they had been worked hard. They had been rowed for 400 years. And, and when we begin to look at them, a lot of times we can't, we can't really picture the struggle because maybe we've never been in that situation exactly like they were, you know, before. Maybe we haven't, you know, had like slave drivers over us or anything like that. Um, but I want you to know that when we look at our own struggles, you know, they can begin to look like a lot of this as well when we really think about it. And, and so many of us are still searching for freedom, you know, in many areas of our life, whether it be our past, whether it be anger, whether it be alcohol or drugs or sexual immorality or, you know, our, you know, money, financial situation or health, whatever it is, you know, the list can go on and on. But so many of us are struggling with something, right? Some of us are struggling with multiple things because a lot of times, you know, one thing leads to another, right? So... We begin to, to feel just like the children of Israel. We begin to feel powerless in our struggle. And, and the reason we begin to feel like that is because of our re repeated attempts to you know, become free. And, and those repeated attempts, those, those multiple tries, you know, the trying and the struggling. And, and you know, it talks about you know, we, we live lives that are hills and valleys and they're constantly doing this. Sometimes it can take its toll, right? Well... What can happen is that can lead to a feeling of powerlessness and, and hopelessness, just like the children of Israel face in this situation. And so many times we have become a slave to the sin or the struggle that surrounds us. But notice in this passage that the Lord, he says, I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. First thing I want you to know is that God's concerned about your struggle. Yes, sir. He's concerned about what you've got going on in your life. And it doesn't matter if it's something, you know, real little or, or huge and big. I want you to know that he's concerned about it. He loves us. He cares for us. And, and I've told you many times he wants to see us prosper. Brother, I appreciate you. He wants to see us prosper. But we've got to want it for ourselves. See, I've said many times that, you know, there's so many people out there that are they're, they're looking for help and they want help and they want freedom and they don't want to be enslaved by the things that they struggle with for so many years, but they don't want to help themselves. 
They're not willing to take the steps necessary to gain the freedom. And I want you to know this morning, if you're struggling with something, and it doesn't even have to be anything bad. So sometimes, you know, we have things, you know, go wrong in our life, and all of a sudden, we're in financial debt, right? You know, financial debt, you know, you know God wants to, you know, bring you out of that debt. And it might sound like something that, you know, well, you know, I, I did this to myself. You know, I, I made some bad decisions and, you know, we went through a, you know, not only went through a pandemic, but, you know, the economy crashed back in 2007 and a lot of people lost everything they had. And, and we haven't regained it yet. And we're still trying to fight. I want you to know that God, he wants to, you know, in every part of your life, he wants to give you freedom. Whether it's to sin, whether it's to debt, whatever it is, he wants to give you freedom. So first off, he's concerned. Secondly, I want to point out what they did here. It says, I have heard them crying out. I have heard them crying out. When's the last time that you cared enough about what you got going on that you cried out to God? Because, you know, when I begin to think about, you know, somebody crying out, I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about the, you know, oh God, I really do wish you could do this. No, I'm talking about you're so desperate that you say, God, I, I need you right now. I'm struggling right now. And just thinking about what you've got going on, it brings tears to your eyes because you don't know what to do anymore. You've exhausted everything else. But we've got to understand that so many times we become exhausted because we didn't take it to God in the first place. Because that's where it was supposed to be in the first place. We exhaust ourselves with things because we didn't take it to God first. You know, so many times I begin to wonder about this, this children of Israel and, and, and why they had to suffer for so many years. And I personally think it's because they had forgotten how to cry out to God. Because, see, here's something that, you know, I don't want to blow your mind with this morning. But, you know, we're going to celebrate Independence Day, you know, on Tuesday. And it's great that, you know, we're, we're independent and we are an independent people. But I want you to know that God doesn't want you to be fully independent. Yes, he wants us to live in a free country. I believe that in all my heart. But there's so many of us that we take that independence and we apply it to our own lives. And we think that we don't have to be dependent on anybody. When God, he wants you to be dependent upon him. And we need to be dependent upon God. We've got to be dependent upon God. I don't know about y'all, but I need God every single day. And just like I told, told my friend last week, I need God. And I need Jesus and a lot of them, Brother Eric. You know, because, you know, I ain't got it all together. There, there's, you know, times that I, I'm a mess. But, you know, God, he can take a mess and he can form a message. He can take whatever you've got going on. He can take the test and turn it into a testimony. I promise you, you can. Now, I want to go back just a little bit. I want to go back to Exodus chapter 1. To kind of the, the beginning of, of some of these struggles. And I'm going to be starting with verse 8. Now, a lot of us have heard the, the story of, of Joseph and how Joseph became the, the right-hand man to Pharaoh and, and all the trials and the tribulations that he, he went through to get there. But God had him in the right place exactly where he wanted to be as our brother preached. That's exactly where he wanted him, brother Eric. Had he not been there, who knows what would have happened? You know, because there were provisions that God showed him in, in, those, in those dreams that Pharaoh was having. And, and Joseph interpreted them. And, and it took care of not just Egypt, but all the surrounding area. He saved them. So keep that in the back of your mind here with this first verse. It says in Exodus 1 and 8, it says, Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Doesn't that sound like the devil right there? Doesn't that sound like what the devil's doing in this country right now? Is he's trying to shut up the Christians. He's trying to shut up the children of God and make them think that they don't have a voice. I want you to know that you've got a voice and you need to use your voice. It's time that we stand up and rise up. And we understand, you know what? We are numerous. We are numerous. 
And strength is found in numbers. And I want you to know there's a lot more of us than we think. There's a lot more of us than we can even begin to fathom. You know what? If we would just rise up together, I promise you, things can change. Same thing, Pharaoh saw this coming. He says, you know what? They've got numbers on us. And if, they're, if their minds begin to change, if they understand that, you know what? They can overpower us by their numbers. And, you know, they're tired of being, you know, stuck under slavery and, and, and being, you know, stuck in ca captivity. They might rise up and, and do something about it. It says in verse 11, it says, so they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. To oppress them. See, that's what, that's what the enemy wants to do to you. He wants to oppress you. He wants to... You know, get in there and he wants to play mind games with you. He, he wants you to, to feel like a slave that's been beaten down. That's been worked hard. It says that they oppressed them with forced labor. And they built Pithon and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. This is kind of like I feel like the Egyptians had what, what we like to call when I was growing up. My daddy taught me this, so if you got a problem with it, please see him. I'm the one to say it, though, so you can come see me too. The Egyptians had a little land syndrome. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know what? I've been around on some big dogs before. I had one named Trip. He was huge. And that dog, I mean, as big as he was, he was loving, he was friendly. And he was just awesome. He didn't really bark a whole lot or anything like that. But there, you had a big old dog too, Diesel. That's right. Big old, what was it, Doberman Pinchers? Yes, yeah, those dogs were big. Dylan, you know, you remember Diesel, don't you? <laughs> Diesel was the same way. You know, Diesel, and it just loved him and all that stuff. But how many of y'all been around a Chihuahua before? <laughs> how many of y'all owned Chihuahuas? Anybody? All right. I'm going to go ahead and just ask for forgiveness. But man, I can't stand them dogs. I mean, they ain't but this big, and all they do is run that mouse all the time. All the time. No, and at any point, we can just say, Poop. I'm sorry. I love dogs. I'm just trying to paint a picture here, all right? I love dogs. But I feel like the Egyptians were, would be like, you know, a little bitty chihuahua, you know, up against, you know, diesel or trip, you know, one of those big old dogs. And all they're doing is sitting there barking, 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 knowing at any point in time that that big old dog can just rip it. Yeah. See, that was the Egyptians. They were scared of their power. And I want you to know that the devil is scared of your power. He is scared of our numbers. He's scared of when we, we come together. Just like right now, we're in this place, and you know what? This place not be, might not be completely full, but you know what? There's enough of us in here that, man, if we really got together and we, you know, united, man, the devil would just be trembling right now. And he's already starting to tremble right now just in the spirit that I'm going to fill this place because he feels a stir. He's shaking in his boots. So this is how they decided that they were going to go about it. It says they were going to oppress them. And it says the more they oppressed, the more that they spread. And they had grown to dread the Israelites. And then they worked them ruthlessly. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to work you over. It says that they made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar. And with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. See, for a lot of us, that's what's happened. Is the devil has been working on you for so long. And you've been so bound up and you've struggled with whatever it is for so long. That you become not only you feel helpless and you feel hopeless. You feel powerless, but you feel bitter. You feel bitter about the whole situation. I want you to know God doesn't want you to be bitter. He wants you to be better. That's what God wants. He wants to lift us up out of that captivity. But see, the issue is, is that sometimes, and th this is a mind game with the devil. I was taught from the time I was a young man that 
one of the greatest battles you'll ever fight is right here between your ears, right here in your mind. Some of us have accepted that as normal life. Some of us have, has accepted that as, as our comfort zone. You know what? You know, I can't do anything about it, so I'm just going to stay right here. You know, I want you to know God never meant for you to be a captive. He never meant for you to be a, a slave to, to sin or whatever struggle you've got. But I want you to know that He has provided a way out. See, just like God was about to do this for the, the children of Israel, because in a few verses down, you'll have to go read it. Just, you know, take my word for it. I, I, I've read it several times. The Egyptians came up with another plan that they were going to start killing the firstborn child of each household. And see, that's when Moses' mom put him in that, that Nile River and sent him down river. And see, God provided them a way out. He provided them a way. I want you to know that Jesus, He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's our way out. But the problem is, is we, we become comfortable in that situation. In Psalms 107, 10 through 14, David writes about this. He says, some sat in darkness. They sat in, it. in utter darkness. Prisoners suffering in irons chains. Because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. But then in verse 13 we see they, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away the chains. That's what God wants to do for somebody this morning. Is he wants to break away the chains of whatever's got you bound. Whatever's causing you pain or strife. As I said, Jesus, he is that way out. And, man, I just, I love reading the word of God sometimes because, you know, I'll be reading it and, and somebody will confront Jesus about something and then Jesus comes out with, you know, like a little one-liner or something like that. I'm like, man, Jesus was a bad man. <laughs> Jesus, he would, you know, he, he knew what he was doing. He did because... God knows, you know, I need more of that in me because I'm, I'm that type. When somebody confronts me, when they start, you know, barking at me, you know, I can take it for a little while and all of a sudden, I'm, you know, I want to start barking as well. You know, and I'm like, hey, if you want to stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe, we'll go. You know, I'll lay hands on them. In Jesus' name. But we get like that sometimes, don't we? Sometimes we can only take so much. But Jesus, he just seems, he seems so just calm and cool. He's like a cucumber. I mean, he's just, he can handle the situation. And I want you to know, he can handle your situation this morning. But I love it here when it says in, in Luke 4, 18, it says, the spirit, this is Jesus talking now. I want you to know, he'd been confronted. He was in his hometown and they had asked him to, to read from the scroll. Now, they didn't tell him what to read, but Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus liked to throw some stuff in there, you know, he threw a little curveball. So Jesus begins to read this from the scroll. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now think about that. Think about what he just read. Now, I know that he was reading the words, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me. He has sent me. But I want you to know that what he was reading wasn't something that he, you know, just came up with from his own. No, what he was actually doing is he was reading Isaiah 61. He was reading from way back when, when Isaiah was telling him, hey, there's somebody coming that's going to break, a, break the chains of sin. He's going to release us from all this, this slavery and this, you know, what we've endured. And he is the answer. See, Jesus knew what he was doing here. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind. 
to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, this is what, just paint a picture, all right? Just get, get this in your head. And then verse 20 comes, it says, Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Jesus, he put it out there, and he said, here you go. Y'all chew on that for a second. And then their mind started to get disturbed. It says, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened to him. All eyes on Jesus because of what he just said. Now I want you to think about what he said next. This wasn't from Isaiah 61. Then Jesus said, he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, hey, that me that it was talking about, that's me. That's the I am. That he told Moses, he said, who should I tell him when I go and talk to him? He says, tell him I am who I am. I am. He is the I am. He is the Almighty. And he's come so that, that you can have freedom. See, Galatians 5 and 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. See, one of the saddest parts about this, this story with the children of Israel is that, as the kids sang this morning, Moses went to Pharaoh and he said, Hey, he said, let my people go. We talked about it a little bit on Wednesday night, you know, when all the plagues came through. And then finally that death angel came through and they had to put the blood on the doorpost. And if you didn't have the blood on the doorpost, when that death angel came by, you weren't covered. You weren't covered. I want you to know it's time to plead the blood back over our, our houses. Yes. Time to plead the blood back over our lives. But the sad part is when God brought the children of Israel all the way out, they got to a point right before the promised land and they had endured for a little bit longer. They got angry with Moses and they told him, they said, you know what? They said, we, why, why did we even leave Egypt? You know, we just want to go back into slavery. See, I feel like that's our, our mindset sometimes. That we decide that it's time to, to stand up it's time to take our life back. It's time to take our situation back and give it into God's hands. But sometimes it's a process. Sometimes there's there's some things that, that have to be you know taken care of before we can you know exactly receive our, our freedom of what God has promised. And instead of being willing to stand up and fight like God wants us to, we go back to exactly what we were enslaved by before. We just go right back to it. See, God, He wants you to know that, that when He has set you free, that, that you are free indeed. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, is there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled, unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is Spirit. See, that's what God wants us to do. Is He wants to transform us and what we were meant to be into His image. I preached a sermon one time on a Wednesday night about a caterpillar. And, and how that caterpillar, you know, it, it'll begin to eat all these leaves and, and different things like that. And, and it will fatten itself up. And, and then it comes to a, a time to where it will go up in that cocoon, right? And then it stays in that cocoon. And, and, and I can't remember all the scientific stuff, but I do remember this, is that it stays in that cocoon for, for 14 days, roughly. And then, from that cocoon, it begins being transformed by a process called metamorphosis. But then, when those 14 days are up, guess what happens? 
It just turns into a butterfly. All right. That's not how it works. It's the end game, but it's not how it works. See, what happens is the caterpillar in that cocoon, it has to fight its way out. It has to decide, you know what? I want to be transformed, and I'm tired of being stuck in this cocoon, and I'm going to do everything I can to break myself out of this, and when I come out on the other side, I'm going to have wings, and I'm going to fly, and I'm going to soar, and I'm not going to have the same desires that I used to have when I was a caterpillar. See, caterpillars eat one, they eat the, the green leaves and stuff, but see, see, butterflies, they eat you know, this nectar and pollen and stuff like that. And you know what it does is, Brother Mitch, that when they begin to eat that pollen, they help pollinate everything and they spread all that goodness. See, that's what God wants you to do. When he's brought you from that cocoon, he wants to give you a different appetite for something new. And then he wants to take it and he wants you to spread it all over the place and tell your family and friends about it so that you can have new life all around you. One of the things that I talked about in that message is that, you know, we, we see these caterpillars and I actually saw one on a truck last week in our shop and it was actually the first time I'd seen a caterpillar in a while. And it was climbing on the truck and all that. But then I began to think about, you know, that butterfly. And one of the things I said in that message is nobody has ever looked at a butterfly and said, look at that caterpillar with wings. Because it was completely transformed, just like it says in my word, that we would be transformed into a new creation. Yes. Amen. You ain't a caterpillar no more. You're a butterfly. Yes. See, that's what God wants to do with us. And a lot of times, the battle starts right here. He wants to break us of our, of our mind. He wants to break us of our thoughts and where the devil has enslaved us for so long. And he wants to get our, our minds right. He wants us to be able to break habits. And I know I said that, you know, it's funny to me that that, that that caterpillar has to be in that cocoon for about two weeks because, you know, a lot of scientists have said that two weeks of doing something repeatedly is the amount of time that it takes to break a habit. Now, whether, whether or not that's exactly true or not, whatever. But I want you to know that you can decide today to leave it down here at this altar. God can do it right now. You don't have to wait two weeks. God can take that from you. And he can begin to turn you into a new creation. But you know what? You've got to want to fight. you got to want to break out. You can't be fine and comfortable in that same status that you've always been in. You've got to want to be something new. you got to want it for yourself. See, John 8, 34 through 36, it says, Jesus replied, Verily, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. See, that's what Jesus wants to do is he wants to set you free. He, want, he doesn't want there to be any doubt. That's why I like that, that word indeed there. No doubt that you are free indeed. That you're not one of those type of people that, you know what, that, and Jesus won't do this to you, but maybe, you know, you've got, you know, shackles on your feet or your hands or something like that, and somebody breaks one into the shackle and you break free and run off and you still got something attached to you. See, that's not what God's want. He wants to break every chain. He wants to break every bondage. Now, I want to point something out to you that God hit me with this past week when I was praying and study for this message. And I'm pulling one out of your book, Brother Harry. I've got a strong concordance and that thing is huge and thick and I've got it back in my office. And uh, technology is nice sometimes. And so Brother Eric, he had sent me something one time um, from a strong concordance, but it was digital. And I was like, man, where'd you get that at? And he said, I got this little app, it's the strong concordance app. And I was like, well, praise God. That's awesome. It, it was great. And so I want to read this verse to you. And it's a verse that we read often. Very familiar verse. But I want to point out something that, that God hit me with this past week when I began to think about it. Acts 2 and 38, it says that Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift 
of the Holy Ghost. Everybody see that? It says, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Brother Wesley, will you put up that first picture? Now this is what I see in my strong concordance, Jill. <laughs> I hear dropped a picture to Jill that was supposed to be of me with a picture of a llama that I saw last night. And it was actually this. And uh, she said, well, like some kind of Arabic stuff. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So this is our verse. Would everybody agree with that? Everybody look and see that that's our verse. Peter said unto them, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, these little numbers that are on the right-hand side of, of these words, what that does is you can go and click on that when you're in this app, and it will tell you the actual, you know, backing of those words, you know, what the actual either Greek or Hebrew or whatever it is, and other meanings of the word. So, Brother Wesley, will you put up, all right, G859. Hey, Wesley, actually, go back one, if you don't mind. I should have pointed this out first. Does everybody see the word remission? G859. All right. Now go back to the other one, Wesley. G859. I'm not even going to begin to start translating all this and all that. But definition, it says remission, freedom, figuratively, pardon, deliverance, forgiveness, liberty, remission. Does everybody see that? Now, Wesley, go back to the, not the other picture, but the original verse, Acts 2 and 38. Let's read it again. Because I thought about this thing one way for so long. And uh, this might not be a new revelation to somebody, but it was to me, so I want to point it out. It says, then Peter said unto them, repent. Now, that's the first part of that step. That's saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did. I don't want to do it again. Repentance isn't just being sorry, but it's a turning away from. Yes. Going the opposite direction. And so many times I have I have said, you know what? You know, that repentance, that's where forgiveness takes place. But then God hit me with this. Because see, Peter said, repent first and then be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. See, repentance is just part of the plan. You can come down and you can ask for forgiveness all you want to. But what he really wants you to do is go the extra step to number two. And he wants you to go down in that water. And he wants you to bury whatever you've been struggling with. So that he can make you free. See, if somebody thought that baptism wasn't essential and that it was a necessity, that verse right there in that translation proves it wrong. Because if you truly want to be free or re-free from whatever you've been struggling with, then you've got to get in that water. And you need to bury it in the name of Jesus Christ. Sometimes there's things we need to rebury, right? Sometimes, for some reason, we go and we dig stuff back up sometimes. You know what? It's time to rebury whatever you've been struggling with. Whatever you pick back up. I don't know what it is. But it's time to rebury it. That's why I'm a firm believer. You know, some, some pastors and churches preach against rebaptism. I don't. In fact, I welcome it. Because I would rather be sure than unsure. And I want you to know that there are times that, you know, just like my situation. I was baptized when I was 14 years old. I knew why I needed to be baptized. I knew, you know, exactly everything about it. But then you go through life and you go through a lot of stuff and, and stuff can, can, you know, get all trapped up inside of you and it can cause you to become unclean again. And so when I was 28 years old and actually me and you on the same day, brother, we were both, I guess, was that your, were you, were you being rebaptized? Both rebaptized. We were rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ on the same day in the same pool. Because of the same thing. Yes, sir. Is that God wanted to cleanse us again from everything that had given us so much trouble. That had enslaved us and had us bound. See, I want you to know that if you need a re-cleansing, God's got that for you. 
But then I want to point out this, this last part. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, most of the time when somebody goes and gives you a gift, they give it to you and they don't ask for anything in return, right? They give it to you and if, if they're given for the right reason and the right purpose, they'll give you something without wanting anything in return. But that doesn't mean that it didn't cost them something. That doesn't mean that, you know, they had to do something in order to get that gift so that they could give it to you. And see, I want you to know this morning, and Brother Mitch, you were all over this this morning with your opening. It says in my word in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death. See, that's how much sin costs was a death had to take place. And that death took place on a cross almost 2,000 years ago. And God's blood was poured out for each and every single one of you so that we could be free from sin and have eternity in heaven with Him. But I want you to know that there's another death that's got to take place. And that's a death within us. See, we've got to die out to this old person. And we've got to be what Jesus calls when He talked to Nicodemus was you've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. See, if you want to be free, you've got to die out to this this old flesh. You've got to die out to your old way of thinking. And you've got to be born again. Jesus went a step further and he says, unless you're born of the water and of the spirit, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's important. It says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, what we've got to understand is that Holy Ghost, yes, it is a free gift, but that doesn't mean that it came free. See, Jesus died and he ascended into heaven and he told the disciples and all the followers around. He says, if I don't go, I can't send myself back down. That's why he ascended so that he could send his spirit back down so it could empower us. So it could strengthen us. So it could correct us and rebuke us and guide us in every way that we should go. See, friends, what we've got to understand is freedom is not free. Just like we're about to celebrate independence, it came at a cost. It wasn't free. Somebody gave their life so that you could have freedom. And if you want to be free, you'll be willing to put your life on the line. It was purchased with a price. I'm going to ask if everybody would stand this morning. If, if I can have our musicians and singers come back up. I think a lot of pastors, we, we, we like analogies. I've learned that, that most pastors like analogies. And, and one of my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time, and I don't know how many times I've seen this movie, and it can be where I'm flipping through the TV and I see it on and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and watch it again. It doesn't matter what part of the movie it's in, I'll watch it. But that movie is The Shawshank Redemption. Anybody else seen that movie or like the movie? You know, I began to think about that movie when I was, you know, studying this message. I began to think about, you know, different different things where I've seen people that have been, you know, they've been bound up and sometimes, you know, incorrectly. You know, they just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And I'll go a step further on this. That's why it's important where you go. It's important who you hang around. But the main character, his name was Andy Dufresne, and, and Andy... He was, he was wrongfully imprisoned. That's what they call it. Wrongfully imprisoned. And so the warden comes up one morning after he was made aware that there was, there was nobody in Andy's cell. He was gone. He just disappeared. But then if you watch the movie, it shows how he escaped and he had, he had dug out a wall, a hole in the wall, and he had been hiding it with a poster. And he finally decided that enough was enough because the hole had actually been done for a while. But something happened in that movie to where he said, enough is enough. I'm tired of being in prison. And so he went out that hole and he busted one of the sewage lines. He busted a hole in it and he got in there. And it says that he climbed out. He climbed on his hands and knees 
for 500 yards the length of five football fields. And it shows when he comes out of that pipe that he falls into a river. And it's a very popular scene that you see a lot of times in other areas. But he comes out of that pipe, out of all that mess, in that river, and it's like it washes and clean. And then one of the one of the scenes that I can see in my mind right now is that he stands up and he does this. I don't want, I don't know what kind of mess you're dealing with, but I want you to know that if you'll start climbing this morning, if you'll start making your way through it, I want you to know that there's cleansing on the other side. But it's important that when we receive that cleansing, that we give God the praise that He deserves. And we lift our hands, and we lift our voices, and we let Him know that we're thankful for being brought out. See, I want you to know that you've got the power this morning. Whether you feel powerless or not, you've got the power inside of you. It's time to activate it. See, it says, before the day of Pentecost, in Acts 1 and 8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And in Luke 10 and 19, it says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. I want you to know this morning that there's one thing that I don't like. I can deal with spiders. I can deal with other different things, but I do not like snakes. And Brother Eric, I've been, I've been studying this, this for a lot probably about four or five days now. Guess what I dreamed about last night? I dreamed about snakes. And it's weird the way that it worked out. Because I, I can tell you right now, I don't know how this would play out if we were really had a snake in front of us right now. But there were two snakes. One was poisonous and one was not. I don't care if it's poisonous or not most of the time. If it's right there around it, I feel it. But the one, it jumped out at me, and I caught it with my hand, and that was the poisonous one. And I knew it was poisonous, and it caused, even though I had it in my hand, it caused the fear to come up with it. And I could feel this while I was sleeping, I could feel my heart pounding. And I took that snake, and I didn't know what else to do with it, to just throw it down. And by the time it hit the ground, I just took my boot, and I just crushed its head. I want you to know that's what God wants some of you to do this morning. I don't know what your stake is. I don't know what's giving you struggles or causing you unrest at night. But it's time to take it by the hand. It's time to put it under our feet. So I want to remind you today that just as Jesus said in that synagogue when he was in Nazareth, the same Jesus is here this morning. He said in Luke 4 21, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I want you to know the scripture can be fulfilled in your life today if you'll give it to it. Let's pray this morning. God, we just thank you for what you're doing in this house. God, I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that you would just begin to work in hearts, work in minds. God, I pray that you would just begin to speak to your people here. Let them know, God. Jesus, that we weren't meant to be enslaved, God. We weren't meant to be a slave to sin. God, we're not meant to struggle, but God, you want to prosper us. You want to pick us up, dear Lord, and bring us out of captivity. God, I pray right now that you would begin to, God, open us up this morning, God. Jesus, I pray that you would just give us courage, dear Lord. Jesus, to take that step out in faith, dear God, and take back what is rightfully ours. God, I don't, I don't know all the struggles that are in this house this morning, but you do. God, I pray that you would just begin to meet every need that's in this place this morning. And God, I thank you, dear Lord. I thank you for being mindful of it. And God, I thank you for the work that's about to take place in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to come down to this altar and spend some time in prayer, this altar is open. And I urge you to do it. Don't continue to struggle with what you've always struggled with, but come give it to him today.